So again, we're still in 1.2, and we're going to talk about units here. Now, when we go to, to work out questions that involve units, units of measure, units of volume, we need to see how they're labeled. So if we have, let's say, volume, we'll start with volume and cubic units. So when we talk about cubic units, we're mainly talking about volume. Okay, so cubic units, volume. And what are we talking about? What are we meaning with, by cubic units? Well, you could look at cubic inches. So your engine in your car, they figure out how much it is by its volume, how much it displaces. So that's cubic inches. You can have cubic feet. That might be the volume of a room. So volume is going to be in cubic units. You can have cubic centimeters, cubic millimeters, and all of those. So cubic units normally relate to volume. Now, volume can also be milliliters and liters. When we talk about cubic units, it's normally going to be a volume. When we talk about square units, we're looking at area. So square units are area or surface area. So area or surface area is going to have square units, so square inches, square feet. You could even have square miles, square kilometers. Those are all dealing with an area or a surface area. So if we have an area or a surface area, it's going to have square units. What about the base units? Well, the base units those are working with lengths width perimeter circumference anything you can measure that's going to be your base unit Okay, so when we talk about base units, that's going to be things like feet, yards, meters, miles. Those are all going to be in the base unit. So if you're doing a length or a width, it's not going to be square anymore. It's just going to be that base unit. And this, I think, is helpful because sometimes students get confused as to, I got an answer, but what's my unit? Is it a square unit? Is it a cubic unit? Is it just the unit itself? So this, I think, is the easiest way to look at it. Cubic units relate to volume. Square units relate to either area or surface area. And your base units are going to be your length, your width, and your perimeter. So if it's a length, width, or perimeter that you're finding, it's your base. Area, you're going to have a square unit. Volume is usually going to be your cubic units. And then you've got things like time, and rate. Okay, those are on their own, but let's talk for a moment about the time. Okay, what about time? Well, time can be measured in minutes, hours, seconds, and so on. Okay. What about rates of speed? Well, rates of speed is going to be a, a speed or a, a, a unit of measure over time. We'll call it the speed over the time. So what would that be? That would be like miles per hour, meter per second, kilometers per hour, and so on. So whenever we talk about rate, it's going to be some type of speed over a unit of time. So rate's always going to be written as a fraction like this. It might be miles per hour. You might abbreviate that MPH or KPH for kilometers per hour. Well, you can have meters per second. You can have feet per second. 
but whenever we talk about a rate of speed, it's going to be a, a whenever we talk about a rate, it's going to be a speed divided by a length of time. So this, I think, should help, should help us figure out how to label our answers. In 1.2, when we use these formulas, they're going to give us information. We're going to have to then find the correct formula. In the back cover of your textbook here, did I make a mistake somewhere? Oh, sure, let me move this back down again. Sorry about that. Make sure we can see it all here as much as possible here. Okay, so those are going to be our units. Sorry about that. If I go too fast, just be sure and tell me. So in the back cover of your textbook, we have all the formulas that we might need. So in the back cover here, these are all the ones we're going to be using. So anytime we need a formula, we go to the back cover of our textbook, find the numbers that go into the formula, calculate out the formula, write the answer down, and then label it at the end. So when we work with these, I don't put the labels on until the very, very end. I think it's easier that way. I think we're less likely to get confused with units of measure everywhere, so I put them on at the very end. So let's look at a couple of these. And I'll just pick these from our textbook. And how about we look at question 39 on page 74. So I'll put the textbook up here so we can see it. We're on page 74. We're going to look at question 39. Whenever we look at an application, what we do is we read the application. We identify what we're doing. We're going to find the correct formula. We're going to calculate it through, and then we're going to label it at the end. Nora traveled from Kansas City to Louisville, a distance of 520 miles in 10 hours. Find her rate in miles per hour. Okay, so, what are we looking for? Well, we've got a distance. So we're going to go to the back cover of our textbook, and at the very bottom, we have under other formulas, we've got distance. And distance equals the rate times the time. Okay, so what do we know? Well, so far, we know the distance, don't we? Let's see what it says on, on that third end. We've got several pieces. We're going to have to find the missing. So we know we have a distance of 520. So my D is going to be 520. Um, time is 10 hours, so T is 10. What part are we missing? We don't know the R. So we just plug our numbers in. 520 equals, we've got 10 for the T, the R left over. Okay, we just plug the numbers in. These are very, very simple, easy to do. Divide by our 10, and that gives us an R is going to be now 52, right? And it tells us it's going to be in 50, it's going to be in miles per hour. But if it doesn't, how would I know what the unit would be here? Well, this is a rate, right? And so rates are going to be that distance over the time. And what's our distance measured in this case? Miles. What's our time measured in? Hours. So what would our rate of speed be measured in? Miles per what? Hour. And you can abbreviate that MPH, or you can write it out either way. I'll just abbreviate it MPH. So that would be your rate of speed, which would be 52 miles per hour. Now, if your distance would have been in meters and your time would have been in seconds, what would it be? Meters per second, right? It's just the distance divided by the time. That's your rate. Rate's always a ratio like that. So again, these are, are much simpler than the other components of this section. 
So let's look at another one here. Um, how about we look at question 47. And this is going to be on the next page, which is page 75, question 47. A sheet of standard size copy paper measures 8.5 by 11. If the ream is 500 sheets of this paper has a volume of 187 cubic inches, how thick is this ream? Now, why is it cubic inches here? It's cubic inches because this is a what? Volume, right? These are lengths and widths, so they're just in regular base units. Now, when we find our answer, our answer is going to be in a base unit. Why? Because we want to know the thickness. That's something that we measure. So we're not using cubic inches. This is going to be for our thickness in just regular inches. Right? So you see how, how these work. Think about what you're finding. And if it's a base unit, a square unit, or a cubic unit. What are we doing? We are finding the volume. Right? We've got a volume. So we go to the back cover of our textbook. And we are looking here at a rectangular saw. It kind of looks like a ream of paper. Oh, yeah. Yep. And your volume, you are correct, is your length times your width times your height. Okay, so that's going to be your, your volume. Okay, so B stands for your volume. So we know our volume is now, on question 47, our volume is 187, and it's cubic because it's a volume, and then we've got our length and width, doesn't matter which one we call what, so we got 8.5, we'll call our width 11, what do we not know? We don't know the height, that's our thickness, and that's what we need to find. Plug our values in, We've got 187 equals 8.5 times 11 times your H. Now we simply multiply them out. And that gives you 93.5 H on the right and 187 on the left. We divide by that 93.5. And that gives us then H equaling now what? Looks like 2. And what's it going to be measured in? It's not in cubic inches, is it? No. Why not? This is a height. So think about what we've got. We're looking at the height of, let's case, in this case, this book. The height of this book would be in inches. So that's going to be 2 inches, not cubic inches, because we're not working with the volume here. Finding a volume, we're finding the height. Let's look at another one. Um, how about we look at 58? Okay, so 58 is going to be next. And this one's going to be looking at interest. So a certificate of deposit for one year is $25.50 in interest on a principal of $3,400. What is the interest rate being paid on this deposit? So again, we need an other formula. So we go to the back cover of our book here. We want interest, simple interest, and this is I equals PRT. Now, I is the interest that we made, how much money we made. Yep, and that would be how much money we made. 
And how much money did we make here? We made twenty-five fifty, didn't we? And then the principal, the P, is how much we start with. Now well, to make that twenty-five fifty, we had thirty-four hundred dollars, right? And the T is the number of years. One. And in this case, it's one. And what do we not know? We don't know the percentage rate that it pays out. Right? So that's the unknown part. We don't know that. The missing component is going to be our rate. And that's as a percentage. So let's go ahead and plug our values in. 2550 equals 3400 times 1 times R. And you can put them in any order. On the PRT, so I just put it where that R was at the end, because that's what we're trying to find. And that gives us then 3,400R on the right. And we're going to have to use a calculator. So we can divide both sides by that 3,400. And that's going to give us a decimal. And when we write our answer, on these, we express them as a percentage. So we get the decimal, and we'll turn it into an interest rate as a percentage. So we take that 2550, we divide that by our 3400, and that gives us then 0 0.0075. And what would that be as a percentage rate? We have to move it over one, two places. So as a percentage rate, it's 0 0.75%. So we didn't make much money because our percentage is so small. And that's, that's what happens when you invest in a bank for a CD. They don't pay you much money, but it's guaranteed money. If you have a credit card, it might be you know, 25% or 20% somewhere in that range. They make a lot, but this is guaranteed money from the bank. If you put money in the, in the bank from a CD, you're not going to get a lot. So that's why we only made $25. Because our percentage is so low. But that that's reasonable. If this would have been a credit card bill that we owed money on, you, know, you might have 21, 23, maybe up to 25%. A big difference there, but that's what a CD would pay out at the bank. So let's now look at one more of these. And then we'll look at some questions from our homework. These again are percentages. And we're going to look at question 73 on page 77. And this is a percentage problem. Question 73. And these really don't require a formula. There is a formula for percentage. I think it's more confusing to use the formula than it is just to read it, identify the pieces, and just calculate it out. So we're going to look at 73. Okay, so in question 73, the movie Transformers The Last Night in DVD was on sale for $16.17. The list price was $17.99. To the nearest tenth, what was a percentage discount? So how much was taken off of this? So we want to know how much money we would, the percentage we would have saved, the, the percentage rate that it's off. So let's see what we've got. We want to find that discount percentage rate. So when we talk about this this DVD, what was it on sale for? Okay, it was on yep, it was on sale for sixteen dollars and seventeen cents. And the regular price is going to be seventeen ninety nine. So how much money did we save? Seventeen 
Yeah, how much money did we save? We took that $17.99. We subtract off that $16.17. Okay, and that gives us then a difference of what? $16.17. That gives us a difference of $1.82. So we saved $1.82, right? Now, we don't want to know how much we saved in terms of money. We want to know what percent was taken off of the price. So how much we reduce the price thought. So now how are we going to do that? Well, we take for our percentage, we're going to look at the money saved. And we're going to divide that by the regular price. And that's going to tell us our discount rate. So how much money we save is we save $1.82. And then the regular price was $17.99. And that gives us then a, dip, or a percentage of, it's going to come out as a decimal. And does it say how far we need to round here? Yep, it says nearest tenth of a percent. So tenth of a percent, percent's two. One more makes it three because we want tenth of a percent. So dividing that through, that's 0 0.10. One or 10.1%. So we save 10.1% when we bought that DVD on sale. So again, what did we do to figure this out? We took the sale price, we took the regular price, we subtracted them. That gave us how much money that we saved. Then we took the amount of money that we saved and divided by the full retail price. Then we rounded it to three places because it wants nearest tenth of a percent. We rewrote that as a percentage and it's 10.1%. So that is what we saved in terms of a percentage. We saved $1.82, which is 10.1%. Now let's look at a couple of questions from our homework now. I am going to look at 15 because 15 and 16 are very similar. They're just using a formula. If you can do 15, if I can do 15, then you'll be able to do 16. So now we're going to look at our homework. 1.2 we're going to look at question 15. You'll use 15 to work out 16. This one is not difficult. It's just a matter of finding out what the pieces are and plugging them into a formula. What this is, is this is going to tell us how much money we save when we pay off a loan early. Now we know if we have a loan and it's supposed to run for, let's say, on a car, five years, and we pay it off in a year and a half, we've saved some money, right, on interest. How much money did we save? Well, this is going to give us an approximate value of how much money we would save by paying that car off early. So what we've got is we've got a formula for the unearned interest, and this is how much money that you saved. So when we... When a loan is scheduled to run, in, uh, sorry, in payments is paid off K payments ahead of schedule, the amount of unearned interest Q is given by this formula, where F is the total scheduled finance charge. So, when we take out a car loan, house is a little bit different, but when you take out a car loan and you sign the paperwork and you have to take out a loan on this car. They give you the paperwork, right? They tell you how much the car costs, and then somewhere in that fine print is the finance charge. 500, 1,000, 1,500, but there's a finance charge. You don't see it, but it's in there. And that's the interest. Now the finance charge means if, if let's say that finance charge is $1,000, and that car note is for five years. If I don't pay that note off early, at the end, I have paid $1,000 in interest. 
Now, I pay that note off early, I'm going to save a portion of that finance charge. And what you've got is you've got, in this case, how many payments you've already made, how many payments are left, and how many total payments you've got to make total for the loan. So you've got how many payments are left, how many you're going to pay off now, how many total payments are in the loan. So when we look at this, we've got in payments. So that means how many months we would have ran that car loan for. So let's say it's a three-year loan. That'd be 36 monthly payments, right? So your in would be 36. And let's say I want to pay it off, and I've got um, 12 months left. I've got a year left in that loan. I want to pay it off. So K in that case is how many payments you've got left. How many payments you're going to pay off now to pay off the loan. And then you've got U, which is how much money you save. And F is that total finance charge. So it's just a matter of getting the pieces in the correct place. Not difficult at all. It's just a matter of identifying what is what. So let's write out our formula and let's try to identify what the terms mean. So our formula is U equals F times K. K plus 1 over N, N plus 1. Now, U is the unearned interest, the money that you save. So when it talks about how much money you save, that's your U. Now, F is our finance charge. That's what they tell you you're going to have to pay for the finance charge. So if you run the whole note out, that's how much money you really paid to the bank for carrying that loan. Then we've got K, and K is the number of payments that are left. We've got N, which N is the total number of payments. So those are the pieces. Here's our formula. Now let's try to go ahead. Let me try to keep this up here so we can see both of them, hopefully. And we're going to go ahead and read the, the application, and we're going to figure out where all the pieces go. So here's our, our application. The finance charge on a loan taken out by Edward is $499. If there were 24 equal monthly installments needed to repay the loan, so that's two years, right? 12 months in a year. And the loan is paid off in full with 13 months remaining. Find the amount of unearned interest. So, what do we know about the pieces here? Let's try and figure out what we have. Well, we don't know U. U is the unknown quantity. We don't know how much we're going to save. That's what we're trying to find. So U is going to be our question mark. Now, F, when Edward takes out this loan, he is charged a finance charge of $499. You don't see it because it's written into your payment. Like every time you make a car payment, part of your payment goes to the bank. Part of it's towards the car, part of it's towards the bank. And that finance charge is how much the bank is going to get. Now we've got K and we've got N. And this is where students sometimes get them confused. N is always going to be the larger one because N is how much payment, how many payments we're supposed to have. So when I took out this loan, I was going to go ahead and pay this loan off in 24 monthly payments. So N is the total number of payments. So N is going to be 24. So I'm supposed to pay it off in 24 months. But let's say I got my income tax back and I want to go ahead and pay off this loan. And I've been making some payments already. And I've already made um, many payments and I've got 13 payments left. So K in this case is going to be 13. So I've got 13 payments left. So a little over a year is left on the loan 
and I'm going to go ahead and, and write the check and pay it off now. And if I pay this loan off now, how much money am I going to save? Well, we can plug it into our formula and we can get a rough idea. So U is now going to be your finance charge, which is $4.99. And we're going to multiply that then by 13, because that's our K. 13 plus 1 over 24, and 24 plus 1. That's our formula. We have to make sure we're careful on how we work this one out, or we might get a slightly different answer. The last thing that we want to do is divide. Divide is always the last thing that we do. If you divide too early, your number may be, might be off by a dollar or two. So we want to make sure we get the exact same answer that the bank is going to get. So we're going to go ahead and work out our parentheses first. So let's rewrite this as $4.99 again. And we've got 13. And 13 plus 1 is 14. Down below we've got 24. And 24 plus 1 makes it now 25. Here is the correct way of working this out. Take that 499 and put it over 1. What I want you to now do is multiply the top together. We're going to divide at the very, very end. If you divide too early, you'll round off wrong, and you'll get a different answer. You'll be off by a dollar or two. So let's go ahead and just multiply everything across the top, and we'll write that down. So let's go ahead and do that. So we've got our 499 times 13 times 14. I'm going to go ahead and write that number down. And when we divide out, it'll be reduced down, right? So that's 90,818. What about down below? Well, we've got 1 times 24 times 25. That is 600. Now our last step is going to be divide them out. Always divide at the very end. Otherwise, if you divide too early... Your answer might be off by a few dollars. And so what does that then come out to be? That comes out to be $151. And if we round, 36 cents. And that is how much money we would save if we paid it off with 13 months left. Now what's going to make the biggest difference on how much money you save? Well, the more payments that are left, the earlier you pay it off, the more money you'll save. If this would have been 22, you would save a lot more money. If this would have been 22 payments left, then this would be really close to the 499. And so the, if you would have went, if you would have let K go down to like three or four, it's not going to save much money at all. If it would have been three or four, you might only save fifty dollars. Okay, but with 13 payments left we were able to save $151.36. Now you're going to use the exact same concepts and formulas to do 16. Exactly the same, just different numbers, different number of payments, different finance charge, but it's going to be done the exact same way. We've got a little bit of time left. I want to do one more question and then we'll I'll let you leave a few minutes early here. Uh, question 19. And you should hopefully understand this one just from an innate knowledge of perimeter and area. But let's just make sure. Question 19. In order to purchase molding for a window, would you want to measure that in perimeter or the area? Okay, now let's think about what we've got about molding. Okay, molding is like this trim. This, so this trim that runs along the wall. Okay, if I go to the store and I get the trim that goes along the wall, or that wall over here, okay, that's molding. Now that's measured in what? Feet, right? So I say, okay, I need five feet of, of molding. 
that's in feet, so you would add up the area of, or so, the, so you'd add up the amount around, and so that would be in what? Area or perimeter? Okay, area is square units, perimeter is just adding up all the pieces. You would use perimeter, right? Now, why would you not use area? Well, area is measured in square feet. Do you go to the store and say, I want 12 square feet of molding? of boards. No, right? They say, okay, how many feet of this board do you want? It's in the feet, so it's in the base unit. So 19, you would have now a perimeter. <coughs> and if you're doing things like laying tile or laying carpet, that's going to be in square feet or painting a room, right? If you look at the can of paint, it tells you how many square feet it covers. So that would be an area. If you're just measuring around, that's your perimeter, and that's your base unit. So 19 is perimeter, and you can figure out what 20 would be. We talked about it already, but you're looking at tile on the floor. It's a little bit different, but think about if that's going to be an area or if that's going to be a perimeter. So now let's talk about our homework quickly here. And so what did we cover today? Well, our homework, we did 1.1, we did them all, and we did 1.2, we did them all. That's going to be your homework. You do not need to complete the whole packet. All you need to complete is 1.1 one, one and 1.2. One, I am not going to pick it up until we're done with the chapter. So you want to keep up with it. But next class period, what we'll do is the first thing we'll do is we'll come in and I'll see if you've got any questions from your homework. From this packet, from 1, 1, and 1, 2, I'll work them out and then we'll start 1, 3 after that. We'll start a lecture after that. So your homework is 1, 1, and 1, 2. You should be able to do them all. I'll have the videos and the notes posted.